Um, welcome everybody to our uh, second master class with Henry Roseland. Um, and uh, we are very pleased that you could all be here today. Why don't we do very quick introductions. We have a few new people here this morning <coughs> and then we'll get right into uh, to our, uh, our work. Galen, do you have yeah, Sure. Um, my name is Galen Benway. I teach sociology and anthropology at Quinn Sigmund Community College in Worcester. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm Caitlin Jordan, currently a continuing education student here. I graduated Smith last year and I'm working on grad school. Good morning, everybody. Cecil Leonard. I teach uh, business, uh, mostly management and marketing at Bristol Community College. Um, I'm Karen Oster, uh, Chair of Performing Arts here at Middlesex. And I'm Michael Rodman. I teach psychology uh, here and I'm Chair of the Behavioral Science Department. <clears throat> Kathy McCarran, um, Chair of the English Department at Middlesex. I'm Shelley Hawks. I teach art and history and I'm a China specialist. Gail Mooney, I teach uh, literature and English here at Middlesex. I'm Donna Cady, Dean of Global Education here at Middlesex Community College. And uh, we are, um, we will be joined at some point by Amy, also from Quinn Sigmund, who was here yesterday, <coughs> and um, um, uh, Carlos who is our philosophy professor at, at Middlesex. Okay, all right. So. Okay, and this is my good wife Joanne here for the, those of you that are new here. Um, I don't think we should worry too much about the clock today. We can just go on and when you get tired, we'll quit. We have lunch, we will break for that, have a break before that. But I don't think we have to quit right at 12 or right at 1 or whenever you just leave when your head is too full to go on. <laughs> do it that way. Does anyone have their memorized um, quote that they think would be an appropriate way for us to begin this morning? Is someone who would like to do theirs? I have mine. I might need to cheat for a second. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the master said, when you meet persons of exceptional character, um, Think to stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Uh, meeting persons of little character, uh, look inward and examine yourself. Wonderful. Why did you like that? Um, I think that's kind of uh, a little bit of, or not a little bit, but I really believe so strongly in that when, um, and I try to um, share that with my students as well, that, that I liked the idea of that when there are people who we feel are not um, that may have other things going on for them, that we tend to be quick to judge them and not learn from them. And I, I really, um, really liked that idea of learning from people who are um, maybe um, not as well off as we are or, or may have other things going on, that we can really learn a lot from them. I also, self-examination, what's yeah. going on there too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, how much like him am I? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and looking in the mirror and really, um, there's a lot of times when I've, um, because of being a, 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 an acting teacher, there are a lot of times when I'll look at my students and they'll, and they'll do something that I just want to kill them. And then I'll say, wait a minute, that's me, that I'm looking in a the mirror. They are doing exactly what I did at their age. And so it's, so, it, it's, it's frightening to look at them and to know that. But at the same time, I, I've learned now how to step back and go, okay, I know where they're coming from. I, I get that. So it, it can be ugly, but at the same time, very telling. Right. Now this morning, though, we have a room full of people that we stand shoulder to shoulder with. That's all. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. What, what number is that? Do you uh, four, um, 417. Yeah. There were so I many, but that was, I just really, so many that were like. Okay, now, the, the things that we didn't touch on most uh, at all, or hardly at all yesterday, that I want to hit up, at least for a while, because they're important. The family uh, and its relation to politics and to society, its relation to the ancestors and both of those relation to religion. But that's over the course of however long we're going to be together, hour and a half, three hours, whatever it is. What else, what kinds of things other than that do we want to talk about? That is, who has start off with questions from yesterday. I know we covered an awful lot of material, and I was very pleased with the comments and the questions we had talking to each other. What is uh, kind of 
left over? Would you like a short review, no review at all? What is who have what a question about? You see the centrality of the notion of roles to almost mm -hmm. everything else that we talked about. Mm -hmm. What it might be like to be the sum of the roles and that you live them, you don't play them uh, for in this, and how much of a different understanding than you get of the text when you see things that he's not talking about uh, people being rugged individualists or real individualists uh, of any kind of way. Uh, you see the normativity of the roles when he says the father should father. <coughs> As we have a sense of what it's like to be a good father. We have a sense of what it'd be like to be a good minister, a good offspring, a good son or daughter. But notice that those those are obviously, they encumber us. That's what it means to be, everybody's encumbered. Everybody in the room is a son or a daughter. Mm -hmm. You say, well, yes, that's true, but my parents have passed to their reward. But your responsibility to your parents doesn't stop when they're dead. <laughs> we'll come to that later this round. It's very important. Once a son or daughter, always a son mm -hmm. or daughter, until you pass to your own reward. Um, so the encumbrances are, are there. So you're in a sense, quote, you're stuck with it. But that doesn't mean there isn't creativity. That you don't have room, if you will, to be yourself, <coughs> to express your uniqueness. Again, as soon as you think about it, you can appreciate it. If, if you think about the two or three best teachers that you had when you were a student, I bet they didn't share too many things in common. Mm. This one was very funny. This one was very stern. I usually didn't like stern teachers, but this one somehow made me feel important, even though it was a real taskmaster. Sometimes you can bring it off, sometimes you can't. Think of your friends. Are there anything all of your friends have in common other than being your friend? As, you know, doesn't this, this one have a few less than redeeming ways, but he has so many redeeming ways. You forgive her anyway. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there, there are many ways to be a good teacher. There are many ways to be a good mother. There are many ways to be a good friend. And that's wherein you express your uniqueness. This is exactly the principles of learning Chinese painting, for example, why you have to copy the masters so much, mm -hmm. and then you branch off on their own. Indeed, it goes so far from aesthetics, and here, uh, Karen, I'd appreciate any comments you have on it, that the Asian tradition in aesthetics is that your create your appreciation of beautiful things is enhanced by attentiveness to detail, mm. rather than detracted from constraints. Feeling, oh, I, I can't paint because I'm constrained by this or that, or I can't see do it that way. For the Asians, it's knowing what the form that you're supposed to follow within which you express your creativity. So in, you know, if you see a couple of five-year-olds watching a chess game and they start moving pieces around the board themselves, they may be having fun, but they're not playing creative chess. Gary Kasparov plays creative chess within the confines of the 64 squares and the rules of how the pieces can move. Those of you who know music, listen to the first 12 bars of Beethoven's Fifth. First Toscanini, then Richard Bernstein, Leonard Bernstein, and then Dmitri Rostropovich. Mm -hmm. That's all it takes. You can tell those three guys apart. Mm -hmm. Think of how confining that score is. Mm -hmm. And yet, you can do it. You get the creativity in there. So it's the same way, yes, being a parent is confining. <laughs> but there are many ways to be a good parent and be a good friend to have the responsibilities and so you, you see it in that way. Creativity is only possible within constraints. Without constraints, there's only randomness. And I would say that holds as a general rule not simply in Confucian family relations or relationships. Picasso broke a lot of rules, but he tended to break them one or two at a time. The blue period, <laughs> the cubist period, and so on. He didn't break them all at the same time. He broke one here, another there, and a couple. Uh, 
it's the same sometimes in poetry and things. What gives a line its particular power is that it's ungrammatical. Is there? Um, I mean, I, I when I when I hear that, I think immediately in the in the theater when we um, uh, put together a production that the that the first thing I always, as a director, the first thing we always do is, is, is focus on the theme and focus on the concept. And to me, I hear, some, I hear that, and it, 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 is, it is so similar to the idea of directing a, a, a play and having a concept, and that's the constraints, <coughs> I suppose. But without that concept, then the, the, the play is, is, is all over the place. It needs to have some sort of, of uh, focus, some sort of, um, so that everybody kind of knows where they're going. Is that, would, would you say that um, would be a, yes, a way of explaining Yes, then it would be, I think, also to tell the, the genius of a director yeah. uh, and the way, the reason they want this particular actress or actor to play this role this idea, this aesthetic sense, first came uh, to me actually when I was a graduate student. The Seattle Repertory Theater started up while we were graduate students, and 15 minutes before performance time, every seat in the house was on sale for a dollar to graduate students. So Joanne and I would stand in line, and we'd get in, and we got very early on, we got to see Hamlet, I think it was the opening night. And Hamlet in, in Act One was a very, very go get him type Hamlet. And, he jump, he jump off the, he jumped off the parapet there and he unfortunately broke his ankle. Oh. Mm -hmm. So at the beginning of the second act, uh, this was, it was a very good looking blonde, curly hair, everything. As active as it could be, you could tell. I mean, he was reading the lines, but he was reading them as a real athlete, a real go-getter prince. Act two starts, comes out, horn rim glasses, <laughs> black hair, and a copy of the Mentor Classic Hamlet in his hand. <laughs> He's the understudy, uh, um, but he was a very reflective, yeah, yeah. calm Hamlet. Yeah. Again, reading the same lines right, from the play. Right, right. But my God, to Hamlet. Yeah. Um, he did a great job. I yeah. forgot after a minute that he had the book in his hair. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, and of course, not all directors would like that, I guess. Yeah. Right. And you might encourage this Hamlet, and I guess that's what you mean by the, the focus that has to have an overarching kind of thing. Yeah, the cohesiveness of the of the piece, because when you're um, when you have um, a piece that you're directing, that if you if you all have different ideas, if the actors and everybody has all different ideas about what the play is about, then it then it loses its its um, impact on the audience. Oh, yes. When everybody is on the same page, then they have it's almost like they, they are given this um, little bit of, of structure and then they can flourish. But if they're not given that little bit of structure, they're kind of floundering. Well, and if the audience isn't given structure either, then the audience will flounder. Because, yeah. you know, uh, one of the things that really appeals to me is this yin-yang give and take mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in, in Asian, um, you know, Asian tradition. And, mm -hmm. and in any kind of story, no matter if it's Asian or Western, or you, if you don't have that that give and take, right. then it's not satisfying for any right, part. Right, right. And also, I mean, if you don't hit all of the um, you know the elements in a, in a story itself, yeah. whether the rising it kind of it, it kind of goes back to the whole the Aristotle's the poetics the whole you know this has to be in a certain way in order for it to you know to achieve you know this this sense of pleasure this sense of you know which isn't. For me, a Western con solely a Western right. con yeah, concept. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, but I love that that whole that and I um, I was trying to to write it down when you said it. Creativity isn't possible without creativity is only possible it, within constraints. Is only possible or within confines. Yeah, you have to have the rules of a game to play the game creatively. Yeah, that's great. Or or or, the, or life for that matter. Right. That's, right. The Confucians just make take it from art and music and Monopoly and baseball to yeah. your whole life. Mm -hmm. Do it that way. Well, it's sort of a paradox in that uh, um, mm -hmm. it, with, within restraints, there's a freedom to be the individual. Mm -hmm. Without restraints, it's just that, what's the word you said? Uh, randomness. randomness, and there's no individuality in randomness. That's right. So it's yeah. Uh, not, not at all. 
And it's also, you, you can focus more. I mean, why do we keep going to the opera? We know that if you've seen one opera, you've seen them all. Lovers come together, they really love each other, bad luck, and they die. <laughs> Every opera is like that. It isn't a comedy, okay? But we keep going the same opera over and over. Other operas, concert. How many times have we heard Bach fugues and things? The more we hear them, the more we can focus on how well this performance right. of yes. it is. The uniqueness of the individual. And that enhances our aesthetic sense. And that is, I, I think that it transcends cultural boundaries. Uh, it, it, and that's that the repetition, knowing what's going to come next, allows you to focus all of your attention on how well the person does what comes next. In, um, I, I don't mean to monopolize the conversation, but uh, in, in Chinese opera, when um, you have the uh, you know the 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 roles that are passed down from you know from generation to generation to generation to generation it almost it has that that's the same type of idea is that everybody is you're learning exactly what the person before you did but i mean is that the same idea is that you learn exactly the way after their style you notice when you see paintings uh, chinese paintings uh, uh, by so and so in the style of mm -hmm. And yeah. so what you're getting are things that that person painted copying the master who preceded him. Mm -hmm. It's only after his own teacher would say, all right, you've got him down pat. Now you can go paint something yourself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. You can do, do the next one. Uh, you had your hand up. Well, I, I, if, similar to what Neil was suggesting, that there was uh, <clears throat> there's this idea that you presented that uh, the Chinese self or the Confucian self is, is all relational. But here you're suggesting that each of us have some force that is uh, a creative force that um, <coughs> somehow seems to have some separateness from re re relational uh, activities to me. Because, I'm, For example, if you look at Chinese calligraphy, as you said, there, there's a, a certain way you do a character, but a great master has some expressiveness that is recognizable as that that one person, and so I was just wondering. I'm, I'm wrestling with that a little bit. Oh, what they have is uniqueness, uh, and that, and it's something. about what makes the person unique, and it's only when you know a lot of calligraphy that you can know just how good he is. <laughs> I, I still, I've looked at an awful lot of calligraphy in my life, and I still have. Sometimes people come and say, "Oh my God, isn't that beautiful?" I would say it looks very nice, but <laughs> uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That it, it's it's the same way. It, we're unique also in the way we express our friendship, our affection for our parents. Uh, if you have siblings, you probably all express your affection for your parents in a slightly different way. So it's part of what it means to be unique. The individuality, as you know, so we don't talk about unique persons. A Confucian would have no problem with that. As long as it's understood, you express your uniqueness in your interactions with the people to whom you're related, either by marriage, by birth, by neighborhood, by vocation, by whatever it is. It is that's the way you because sometimes we express our uniqueness much more in some activities than in others. The uh, the super super calligrapher may be. Average father. <laughs> okay, he doesn't express much out of, out of the way in that kind of behavior. Some people are kind of mistresses of all trades, or Jack, Queen, Queen of all <laughs> trades, uh, can, can do that. So it's not the uniqueness. Indeed, I have to look at you, and from the ethical stance. When I said it yesterday, the ethics of Confucianism is exquisitely particularistic. So what I what is appropriate for me to do with you, meaning you, Shelley, mm -hmm. will almost certainly not be exactly the same thing that would be most appropriate for me to do with you, Gail. All right? The more I know the two of you, your hopes, your fears, your dreams, the more I can figure out what's appropriate. So I have to focus to be get to be a Ren person. I have to know 
how to, I have to know what makes you unique. The, know that there is no one size that fits all. And so the behavior I exhibit toward you in meeting my responsibilities might not differ a little much from the way I would discharge the responsibility <coughs> I had to Gail, but it might make a big difference. A big difference. Um, and so that, and I can only do that, and Confucius is always telling us that you attend carefully to who it is that you're with. Mm. Attend carefully mm. and do what is appropriate for that person at that, in that situation at that time. The notion of the individual and it goes along with the notion of autonomy and freedom. See that you can think, you can act, you can do things without thinking of anybody else. And you can even say, no, you can't. You might think you can, but you can't. You can't do that. It's not, that's not who you are. Without the relations, you're nothing. Yeah, that's one, more, one more question. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and I think I'm imposing a Christian point of view on this, but I, I recently heard a president of a <coughs> Christian college, and he was making a speech to the candidate, I mean, the prospective students, and he said, you know, here we don't feel that you're just a, a raft drifting along. He said, I, we think every person is unique and they have unique gifts and that they should do their utmost to develop those unique gifts through that, throughout their lifetime. And I'm just wondering, what would Confucius say to that? Would he think that that's important <coughs> to say, think that there's a purpose for uniqueness for each? It, for him, it's an acknowledgement of fact. We are... I, I do think I am unique. I, I think I differ from Shelley in significant ways. Mm -hmm. I've been living with this woman for 53 years, but I think we still are different from each other. Mm -hmm. um, she yells more than I do. <laughs> 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 uh, uh, that is part of life, and we all have that capacity. It's a way we realize ourselves, if you will, uh, is through that, through the way we do the interactions uh, through our, sometimes even, if you will, our pet behaviors, all I can tell, just how we laugh, how we shake hands, how we hug, uh, how we do our leave takings, how the small little customs and rituals we share at the table when we go to other people's homes for dinner uh, and things like that. Know that it's, but you have to have the conformity, again, for Confucius. The Chinese are much more ritually oriented than, than we are. But it doesn't feel as constraining once you see he's also talking about the little things, handshakes, leave takings, greetings, and things like that. Table manners uh, are also part of the Li for, for Confucius. But it's within those ways that you can become someone special. Um, that is, to exp it's the same with what we're just saying about the aesthetics. You know the rules of the game and you feel comfortable when you know the rules of the game. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something I've used with my students in the past, which you should feel free to use too, although I don't think this happens as much anymore as it used to. I remember telling them, think of the first time you were at a sleepover at a friend's house, and, and you all sat down to dinner, you were probably uncomfortable because you didn't know what the rules of the game were. Does mother serve you or do you serve yourself? Do you wait until father says grace or something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, at home, you just all dig in, so I've got my spoon into the mashed potatoes, and we hear the father over here saying, you know, our father, we thank thee, Father, for the spoon. <laughs> You've goofed. Third or fourth time you slept over at that friend's house, you're perfectly comfortable. Why? Because you knew the rituals <coughs> and the customs. Yeah. You knew what everybody else was supposed to do and what was expected of you, and then you become less self-conscious. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Less self-conscious and you're open more to others. And you stop thinking about, how am I coming across? But rather, what can I be doing with this person? Mm -hmm. Remember, the, the ta is always the, the and put down that become less self-conscious, because that's the key to every spiritual discipline in every one of the world's religion. Ego reduction is a cardinal part of the behavioral patterns. Everything from meditation to chanting to pilgrimages to ritual following, all of it <coughs> involves ego reduction. 
The idea is to get the ego out of the way so the spirit can come out and flourish. Uh, well, that, and that's true whether it's Christianity or whether it's Confucianism, Taoism, or anything in between, uh, all of those. In, in a sense, we don't mean the expression, you know, going back to Shelley, your quote from the president, we want our children to grow up to be independent, to make the decisions on their own. Well, yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> there are certain things, if we're loving parents, we don't want. There are certain kinds of behaviors we like much better than others. We all have values. We like our children to order our values at least roughly the way we order our values. Why? Because we think it's a good ordering. Mm -hmm. How are you going to get away from that? It, you, you just can't. Think, think of, uh, <coughs> here again, an example I use frequently is uh, a father who is uh, uh, his c career has been spent as a union organizer. And he has had a good life. He's had a happy life. He's tried to show the pride he has taken in his work. He's very, very happy when he's able to get a, a group to take uh, on his union as a, as a bargaining agent against the corporation. And he hasn't made a lot of money, but he's made enough to send his son to school and to law school, which is what his son wanted to do. And at graduation, the son joins the largest union-busting law firm in the state. He chose freely, <laughs> said, this is what I want to do. What kind of son is that? And notice, in Western ethics, that's not even a moral issue. We think it's a very important issue, and there's something we don't like about that son. Well, I mean, may not be easy to put our finger on it. Confusion so he hasn't behaved like a son should. That's what, mm. that's what it is. There's no other job. Now, it's not just that father wanted to become a labor lawyer. No. But to go out and do the antithesis of what your father devoted his life to, the father has to feel a failure. Mm. My son has not understood why I liked the work I did, while I took pride in my life and my work and saw the value of it for my fellow human beings, and now he's going in the opposite way. Mm. What did I do wrong? And of course, in this uniqueness, this Christian presence is going to have to say, he didn't do anything wrong. You taught him how to make his own choices, and he did. You just don't like the one he made. <laughs> say, well, just sounds a little mild there. <laughs> There's something going on there. That's right. And you know, it's. It's not the father. There are so many other ways that you know the son could have come to terms not only with his father. Some other kinds of things that could have been done than that. But I, I use that one by saying because you can't find an answer for that in any ethics textbook. You don't just take intro to philosophy, intro to ethics. You can take advanced ethics, and that kind of issue can't arise. It's not that they don't answer it well. It can't even come up as a question. Yet again, when you go from the abstract, which is what tends to be in the ethics books, even when you're doing applied ethics, so to speak, it's very different from lived day in and day out experiences. We're supposed to inculcate values, value ordering in our children. Nobody ever takes on a different set of values. <coughs> We all have, all decent people have good values, but they order them very differently. Mm -hmm. If you're much more worried about security than you are about liberty, well then you don't mind what the NSA is doing. You put up with it. If you really are concerned with privacy or things like that, and you're not quite as uptight that Putin's going to invade New York City next week, then you, you don't like what the NSA is doing. It doesn't mean the other person doesn't like value 